Thank you for tuning into Balanced Black Girl Podcast. My name is Les. I'm your host. This podcast is all about the different things that we are balancing in our day-to-day life, how we can do that while still pouring into ourselves. Now, all year long, we have been focused on the successful era, which is something I coined where I'm talking about redefining success for ourselves and the different things that contribute to our success. So I am super excited to welcome today's guest, who I think can teach us quite a bit about having different successful eras, Miss Morgan Debon, co-founder and CEO of Blavity, and also the host of The Journey Podcast. Welcome, Morgan. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to have you. I feel like this episode has been like a long time coming. Yes. And the fact that we get to do it in person. So much better. Even better. We're actually here <laughs> in LA where yeah. we both used to live and now neither of us do. <laughs> Ain't that right? <laughs> How does it feel to be back in LA? It feels good actually. Mm-hmm. Like I feel the sun is just so healing and I get like seasonal depression occasionally. So I was fighting those blues in Nashville. It was killing me. Is it gloomy? It's in gloomy Nashville? in the winter. It's winter. Yeah. 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 Actually, I didn't realize that Nashville had like real winter. Mm-hmm. I was supposed to go maybe about a month ago for an event and there was this big cold spell Mm -hmm. and they ended up like postponing the event. I didn't go and I was like, I didn't know Nashville got cold like that. Well, they're not prepared for it. (laughs) Yeah, it does. (laughs) Yeah, it was it was wild. I was like, I thought this was the South. I thought it'd be warm. Nah, ice ice every year. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. So as I mentioned in the intro, last fall, I started coining what I call the successful era where Mm -hmm. I was really looking at just my life, my career, kind of redefining my priorities and figuring out what success looks like for me at Mm -hmm. this point in my life. And I would love to hear a little bit more about your relationship to success and how that has changed throughout your career, Mm -hmm. specifically over the past few years, because over the past few years, you've had some big life and career changes. Mm -hmm. So can we maybe go back to the beginning of your career? Let's say 22, 23 year old Morgan. What did success look like to her at that time? Well, you know, I think I grew up um, pretty traditional, you know, two parent household. And I was on that path of, you know, you go to high school, you get good grades, you get a good standardized test score, then you go to a top 15, top 20 university, and then you have a major, you get a job. You know, I was following and checking all the boxes and I never really questioned it. Like it was just like, that's what you do. That's what's been taught to me. That's what my community look like. That's what black success look like. And then when I got into college, I had um, like once I got into Washi, I went to school in St. Louis. You meet so many people from so many different backgrounds. You meet people who are trust fund babies. And I, you know, I saw for the first time kids who had credit cards and were like just had their parents' credit card and it like just was no thing. I saw for the first time people who didn't know how to do laundry and they had a laundry service. And I was just like, what do you mean you don't know how to do laundry? Like, I don't understand what life you're living in New York that like you don't do laundry at 15, 16 years old. Um, And so I just started to see different pathways to different things and um, and different approaches to life. And everyone seemed fine, right? So as I was kind of transitioning into being an adult, I started to question myself like, oh, why why are we working 60 hours a week? Why are we like just so focused on building and um, you know making money and like what this this can't be this can't be it, you know And at the time at 22, 23, I moved from St. Louis to Silicon Valley. I worked at a big tech company and I loved innovation. I loved creativity. I loved like the idea of Silicon Valley, but I had a little bit of a problem with the why, like to what end. And so that's actually when I decided I wanted to be a full-time entrepreneur and started working for myself because I had a clear picture of if I'm going to work this hard, if I'm going to put in this effort, then I'm going to do it building my dreams and I'm going to do it for the people that I care about and the community that I care about because let's be honest, entrepreneurship, you're going to be broke for a while in the beginning. So you got to be okay with the trade-off of the stability of a full-time job for the freedom that comes with entrepreneurship, at least even just freedom of mind. And that's when I really started to redefine what success looked like for me because it couldn't could no longer be an attachment to a certain income it can no longer be attached to a certain status because when you start off as a founder you're at the bottom 
you know, you're hustling. You're trying to get people to pay attention to you. You're doing intros. Nobody's responding. You're doing outreach. Nobody responds. You know, you're raising money and everyone says no. Like, you know, so you're starting at the bottom. So that can't be my definition of how I view success. And so that started, I think, my journey of redefining what that looked like for me. Mm, I love that. There were a couple things there that you said that were like so good. Mm -hmm. One, your initial experience is working in tech and not resonating with the why. And something that I also think about a lot in the work we do specifically for other people is like, who is benefiting from this? Mm. You have talented, creative people who is ultimately benefiting from the work that is being done. Yes. And I think people who are drawn to entrepreneurship, like it's because they're not connecting with the who is benefiting when they're working for other people mm -hmm. and wanting it to benefit like something that's more meaningful. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Either who's benefiting like the founders, the owners, the people who own the actual asset that you work for or the customer. Like who am I serving? Like am I do I feel good about advancing the capitalism <laughs> structure that I'm partaking in? Do I feel good about that? And if the answer is no to both, then you got to reevaluate. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What I also think is really interesting is for people our age like millennials, we came up at a really interesting time where so many more things were available to us. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of us can relate to what you said about checking those boxes of success previously looking really linear. That was kind of what we were taught. Go to school, you get a good job, mm -hmm. you do the things, then you retire. But for our generation, we were kind of the first generation where we had more options and it almost is like a little bit scary. And it's we overwhelming. Don't know what to do with it. Yeah, absolutely. When we could do anything. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when people struggle a lot with, okay, what is it that I want to do? Where do I want to go? It's because they're trying to follow that old system mm -hmm. that doesn't actually work anymore. I completely agree. We have so many options. It's like going in the grocery store and it's like, what kind of ketchup do you want? And it's like, oh, well, do you want the ketchup with no sugar? Do you want the classic <laughs> ketchup that you grew up with? Do you want the ketchup from the random brand from Trader Joe's? Like, you know, and I think that has made people also feel slightly unhappy. I think there's science that backs the more options that you have, the more that you second guess yourself, the more that you are potentially feeling like, man, should I have picked something else? Then, right, the grass is always greener on the other side. I think older generations didn't have as many options. So they potentially felt happier. Totally. And that applies to everything, to jobs, mm -hmm. to dating, to where you can 100%. live. It's, it can be a little bit too much. And then I think when we look to external factors to mm -hmm. help us make those decisions, then it becomes even wilder. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely dating. I mean, I feel like our generation is more and more like not committing <laughs> at all <laughs> to anything. Right. Because <laughs> it seems like you have so many options, but then the options don't seem that good. Like, right. <laughs> You're like, I could be bad all by myself. Right. Listen, I was single for a long time. It took me a while to find my partner. And it's like, it does require making a commitment. It's hard. Definitely. Definitely. I've been watching your reels about <laughs> relationships. I'm like, All my, so good. My jokes. <laughs> yeah, you're single girl. Era. Yes. So good. <laughs> yes, yes. So going back to when you first got into entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. when you got to the point where it's like, okay, you're no longer still at your tech job and starting entrepreneurship on the side. You're going full time into it. Mm -hmm. How did your definition of success evolve at that point? Mm, such a good question. I think that... When I was making that leap, I was in San Francisco. Um, I had been working out of my apartment on Blavity. It was just me and my co-founders were working part-time, but I was the first one to kind of go full-time and really start financing the business. Success was, um, I had to actually define smaller definitions of success. I like had to detach from success is fundraising a certain amount of money or success is having X amount of customers because it's unpredictable. You know, that stuff is actually wasn't in my control. So I started focusing more on success, meaning like taking action every day, ha building a behavior every day. Um, there's this thing called the virality coefficient. So I was really focused on how do I see if this is growing? So if every person that I bring in, they bring in another person, good. Like that's 
that means that we're growing organically and similar to podcasts, right? Like if everyone who listens to this podcast shares it to somebody else, then you're growing organically and that is success. That's engagement. So I started to redefine the metrics that I was looking at. I'm very data driven. So I had like I, my logical brain had to say, okay, well, we got to hold on to something, <laughs> right? Yep. Um, but I tried to make it things that were more grounded in, in behavior that I could control because that helped me feel really like I was in control like I was able to navigate my destiny a little bit better and I wasn't beholden to someone else saying yes or no to whether this dream that I had was going to come alive that's really smart especially when you're in the media space it can mm -hmm. feel like so much is out of your control yeah. between algorithms audiences mm -hmm. other news is happening that distracts people right so figuring out okay what is it that i have influence over what are the mm -hmm. different levers that can move the needle and having that be your driving factor of success makes a lot of sense exactly exactly we started off with a newsletter actually so that was even more like because social media i didn't actually start a facebook page for blavity until like two years in because i did not want to be dependent on the distribution you know so yeah I think I did a lot of things, maybe hustled a little backwards at times. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you learn. But that's how you learn for sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I I think a lot about working hard versus working smart. And I know mm -hmm. work smart is also like another brand that you have where you help entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I think people put a lot of emphasis on working hard. And something that I have to remind myself is like a hamster works really hard running on that wheel, getting absolutely nowhere. That's so right. It can't just be hard. There also needs to be a direction. Yeah. And if hard work was the, actually the answer, so many more people would be successful. Like there are millions and millions of people in this country that work incredibly hard, much harder than me, much harder than you. And they do not reach it, whatever their end goal or their dream was. So that hard work can't be the missing piece right so what is it it's mindset it's opportunity it's taking advantage of what's coming your way and it's it's privilege it's having the positioning to be able to take advantage of whatever's coming your way exactly and you kind of mm -hmm. have that trifecta of all of those things meeting at the right point mm -hmm. and being ready for when ready. opportunities come your way yeah don't sabotage your own opportunities i mean that happens probably more often than we all care to admit definitely definitely did you have moments of doubt during that process that you worked through? And what was your relationship to fear like during that process? Yeah, um, I have a fear of success at times, is what I call it, fear of success, because um, there's definitely times where I have sabotaged like myself. I'll give you an example. When I was fundraising, when you fundraise for a venture startup, I've raised about $12 million. And when you fundraise, you go out and you pitch everyone. And part of pitching, you know every person you pitch, there's a follow-up. And you know that follow-up sometimes is really intense. They ask for your financials. They ask a bunch of questions. You've got to get back to them within 48 hours. Like there's a process and a flow to it. So I would pitch people knowing I did a good pitch. And then I would just like not follow up because I was just, I was like, I don't have the capacity to actually respond to like 10 investors at once, even though the process supposed, is supposed to be you pitch everybody at once, you do all your follow-ups. I did not have the capacity to do that. And I would just drop the ball. And I knew I was dropping the ball. But it's like, girl, why would you go pitch an investor if you already know you're not going to follow up with them, right? Fear of success, like fear of like, having to rise to the occasion even if i know i'm capable this is not the hardest thing i've done there is something and there was something in my mind that said mm, no let's not do this let's actually stay where we are let's stay stagnant let's not grow and so i had to work through um through that i had to trick my brain to saying no you're gonna do the follow-up you're gonna do the process so i used to have to um i would pre-write my emails, because you know what they're going to ask. I would have a document with all the questions that other investors had asked so that I could just copy and paste things. I made it easier for myself, which made it harder for my brain to say, don't do it. Don't respond. It's like, no, you've got it ready. Just press go. Right. Another thing that I've done is um, I would tell my co-founder, Aaron, or my other co-founder, Jeff, hey, I'm pitching these people. Just make sure I follow up, you know, and my relationship with them, I care more about them than I do about myself sometimes. And so not wanting to let them down was another trick that I used to like get through it. Definitely mm -hmm. creating that sense of accountability and almost Absolutely. Kind of gamifying it for yeah. yourself. You got to gamify your brain, <laughs> yes. you know, like too many people, 
your brain is like the most powerful thing that you have, right? Like, so you have to understand your own limitations and just accept them and then say, okay, well, how do I move past this? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that comes from like knowing yourself and knowing sounded like you were able to identify, okay, these are the things that are holding me back and here's a solution to those specific things. And that's super important because I think when people run into that, they often look to other people of, well, what should I do? Mm. But nobody kind of knows your blocks better than you do. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no way for, I mean, you can try maybe a professional therapist, right? But like your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever, they're not going to be able to have enough empathy for your psyche to be able to say, this is how you gamify your brain. No, you got to do that work yourself. Definitely. Yeah. You also mentioned not having the capacity Mm -hmm. to like respond to those follow-ups as being one of the things that kind of held you up a little bit. How Mm -hmm. did you create capacity? Mm, Good question. How did I create capacity? Um, I think I had to ask myself, why was I procrastinating? What was the thing that made me feel overwhelmed? When I say capacity, I really felt like I was overwhelmed and, um, what was overwhelming me was the impossibility of all the answers that I could, the the story, the tone. You know, as women of color, we carry, it's not just that we answer the question. You got to answer the question in a way that they're going to be able to receive it. You got to answer the question in a way that they're not going to put you in a weird box, you know? So it's not just the data, it's the how. And so I had to, um, but it was really actually just doing the work of pre-writing everything out and taking the time to do everything at once and then having that um, bucket And then saying, okay, I'm going to pull from this bucket every single time, which reduced the decision-making fatigue that comes with having that performance anxiety in the moment because I've already done the work. I know my stuff. I know the answer. You take it or leave it, okay? And that, you got to have that swag, right? And I think when people have a capacity limitation, it's partially because there's too many inputs. You got to reduce your inputs and have really clear Uh, decision-making criteria and a point of view on how you're going to engage in all these scenarios. If you're flying at the seat of your pants, you're going to get overwhelmed. Definitely. You could. I have felt that. Yeah. That that was a message for me. (laughs) Oh, for for real? (laughs) That I needed. (laughs) Tell me what's going on in your life. I I just am. So I recently took Balance Black Girl full-time. Right. Congratulations. I talked about. Thank you. And it's almost like what we were talking about earlier where there's so many options and there's so many avenues. And so for me, it's yeah. figuring out, okay, what am I prioritizing at this time? What is actually going to move the needle? Where do I even want to go? Where do I want to take this? And yes. am I doing things that support that direction? Mm-hmm. And almost kind of redefining what success looks like for me as a podcaster, because I think that there are examples of other podcasts and things that people do with their businesses. Right. Am I doing it just because I've seen other people do it or because that's what I genuinely want? Mm. So these are all like all these inputs that I have Mm -hmm. going on that I'm like navigating at the moment. How are you making your decision? Like, have you defined your criteria for making these decisions? I mean, I think and a lot of it is ultimately going back to what interested me when I was younger. Mm. Like, what was I drawn to? Mm -hmm. What did I want to build? What did I want to create before I placed limits on myself? And Mm. am I moving towards that? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, but a lot of it is also like tuning out outside noise. I think that's huge because we're constantly surrounded by more inputs, right? We're, I mean, you're part of an incredible network. So you're seeing everybody's businesses that they're spinning up, you know, all of the the charts. We're constantly looking at how we're ranking. So yeah, it's important, I think, to do exactly what you said. It's like, well, what's my why? You know, why did I start this journey in the first place? And then how am I taking that inner childhood why of not like having all of the reasons why we talk ourselves out of stuff and where does that where does that put you now as an adult yeah Mm -hmm. and I'm I'm also realizing too and I'm sure that you get this as well when people come to you for advice for different things I'm realizing like why are you asking me I'm a stranger (laughs) I don't I should not be the one telling you what you should do with X, Y, Z. Like if it's yeah. hard to do it, do it. And then it's also made me realize how much I have done that to other people. Mm. And it's made me kind of rethink the questions that I ask and the ways that I seek direction. I agree. When people ask me for advice, I rarely tell them the answer. I usually just say, well, this is how I would make this decision. This is how I think about this kind of a problem. And then you do you. Do you. You know, you want to go left, go left. You want to go right, go right. But this is how I would decide to go left or right. 
if I were in your shoes. Because, right. yeah, it's taking advice from people. And if people really quickly give you an answer, I'm like, are you projecting like what you would do? Or did you really listen to what I was saying? Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And if they only have like a teaspoon of information, it's yeah. never going to be a well-rounded answer. No. Not at all. So stop listening to other people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> stop asking for advice. <laughs> Ask them how they would make the decision. Right. Right. That's yeah. a really good tip. Okay. So let's let's like move on to the next kind of part of your yeah. like successful journey. So a few years ago, you made quite a few life changes. Mm-hmm. You were living in LA. You decided to leave LA, move to Nashville, mm-hmm. and just kind of start a whole new chapter of your life. Yeah. It sounded like, based off of just things that I've heard you say on your podcast, on other people's podcasts, that you were also factoring in other measures of success that weren't necessarily Mm -hmm. work-related and that you were beginning to prioritize those things. So can you take us back to that time and kind of what was going on for you? Absolutely. You know, we were in the height of the pandemic, and um, I think for me, I felt... When the pandemic first started, I kind of went into like a war, I call it like a wartime CEO. My my primary focus was Blavity and was making sure that the company was going to sustain itself regardless of what was happening. You know, we have a huge conference called Afrotech and it's in person and it's, you know, a big part of our business. So I wanted to make sure that that didn't, that community that needed us now more than ever because people are getting laid off and all types of stuff was still there. And so I had to isolate myself. You know, I I was single, living in downtown LA in a one bedroom apartment. And I'm just like, go go to the grocery store, go home. Sit home, go to the grocery store. Like literally do nothing. Don't go to the gym, do nothing because I didn't want to get sick. And that took a toll on me. Um, And then George Floyd was murdered. And that was only a few months after the pandemic started. And um then not only was I in war time zone to protect the business on the Afrotech side, I then had to be in a war time zone on the media side because we had work to do. We had work to do to evangelize what was happening, to promote the activists that were on the ground, to advocate behind the scenes with all of these companies who wanted to know how they were going to show up for black consumers. And so, you know, I was depleted. I was depleted on both ends. And I made the decision at that time actually to move to the beach. So, you know, downtown LA is a concrete jungle, like you wouldn't believe. I mean, you you know. Yes. But the people listen, I'm like, it's, it's rough. It is. Okay. Yes. It's rough. It's not like glitz and glamour downtown New York. It's yeah. not that. So I moved to the beach so that I could have a beautiful setting and a beautiful environment. Um, and when you move to the beach in LA, this weird thing happens because everyone seems to be living in La La Land. Like I moved to the beach and you would have thought that there was no election year. There was no George Floyd. There's no pollution. There's no war. There's no nothing. It's just surfing and bikes (laughs) and vibes and volleyball and babies. And, you know, and so I was able to get my work done during the day, which was a lot of effort and then go for a walk. And I think that, um, being in an environment and in a space that was the exact opposite of what I was feeling at the time gave me so much clarity and so much freedom to say, if you're going to sustain as an entrepreneur for the next 10, 20, 30 years of your life, you got to get in an environment that is more chill. Like I will work myself to death if I am staying in this concrete physical environment. I got to get out. And That experience allowed me to say, okay, let me feel more free. And what does that look like for me? So very quickly, actually, I then decided to do a sabbatical for uh, about 60 days in Costa Rica. And I call it my hard reset. I went to Costa Rica with my girlfriends and I gave myself permission to do nothing for 30 days. It was like, do whatever you want. You made it through the panty. You know, you moved. Everybody's okay. The company's okay. You deserve 30 days to do what you want. And I had never had that experience before where I allowed myself to do whatever. And, and I mean whatever. I mean, go. you want to go on a boat and smoke weed and go fishing with the fishermen and then they cook the, the fish for dinner? Do it. You want to walk around with no bra running around Costa Rica? <laughs> Do it like do whatever you want. You want to paint all day and just watercolor and listen to music and eat papayas like do it, you know, and 
that was so freeing to me. And I think particularly as a high achieving person, like how often do we allow ourselves for an extended period of time? It could be a weekend. It could be a week, whatever fits for your life, but like to do whatever you want to do. And that having no responsibility um, and giving myself that permission then unlocked another level of like, I got to get out of LA. I got to move. I want to move closer to my family. I want to move into an environment where I can be more grounded on a day-to-day basis so that I can prolong my ability to continue to make an impact in my community. So I can prolong my ability to be a good CEO and be a better CEO because I'm more balanced. Um, So that was the beginning of a lot of different things in a new chapter in my life. I mean, obviously, this is a balanced black girl podcast. We're in a wellness space. So this should, I just love this, this adventure that you had in Costa Rica and just being able to see how important your well-being is to everything else that yes. was happening and hearing you start to prioritize that. It just makes me happy. It was new. It was new for me because I'd been so responsible. I started the company at 24 years old. You know, we have 200 employees. I felt responsible for everything. And whether I should or shouldn't, who knows? But that's how I felt. And I've carried a lot of that. And, you know, if we do a layoff, I feel every single one. If we had to do a reduction in salary during COVID, I felt every single, every single choice that we made. And I physically felt every single choice. I mean, my face was inflamed, you know, and, um, but that's not sustainable. And I knew entrepreneurship was a lifestyle choice for me. It wasn't just a milestone. It was my, who I am. It's part of my identity. And so I'm like, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work in the long run. I got to I gotta redirect. I got to figure out a better way. And I'm so glad that you did that before. You know, we get to points where our bodies will like force us to. And it mm-hmm. sounds like you were able to get to that point before like you physically yes. had to, which is good. Yes. I've seen the other side as well. Plenty of friends who've just wound up in hospitals. So sad. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do that. No. Y'all. Take your reset before that. Please. Figure it out. Learn how to rest before your body forces you. To. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So important. Mm-hmm. Okay, amazing. So you had that realization. You have your hard reset in Costa Rica. Mm-hmm. And then what was next? Okay, so in Costa Rica, then I broke my lease. I said, I'm not going back to LA. So I had to go back to move my stuff, but I gave away all my stuff. I was I was on one. I gave away so many things, my plants, my beautiful fig tree, you know, um, and I um, broke my lease and then I moved to Nashville and my parents' house. My parents have lived in Nashville for about 10 years. And I've been to Nashville, but I always went as their like daughter. You know, I didn't grow up there. So it was kind of like I'm going to my parents and just stayed in the house. I didn't really go out. I didn't really do anything. Um so I moved into my parents' house. I used their closet as my office. And um, I started to get my finances together to be able to buy a house, to buy my first house. Because I didn't want to live with them forever. I mean, like I'm 30 plus years old. <laughs> um, but I then started to redesign what my life would look like. And I was also single. And I also wanted to put myself in a position to, to meet a man who was more in alignment with my values that had the same goals that I had that um, wanted to prioritize family and relationship over work and living on the coast. Sometimes it can be hard to find men who have those priorities to say. So I moved and ladies, you should move. If you need to move, get out of there because it was better for me to find people who um, were making the similar choices as that I was. And so, yeah, I I bought the house that I think it took me about three or four months to get it together. Buying a house as a full-time entrepreneur is not for the week. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I did that and then started getting set up and just really was taking dating very seriously. Um, And then met my partner and the rest was history. Now I have a baby. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I want to I want to get more into all of this. I am also curious your experiences when you were in that season of yeah. dating more intentionally and ready to get a partner Oof. as a successful woman, as a successful black woman yeah. who is at the forefront of this major company. What was that experience like? Did you find that people were intimidated by you? How did mm. you navigate that? 
You know, I don't think that I found people were intimidated. I think the men who were intimidated never shot their shot. So like, I didn't really talk to them. I'm sure there was a bucket of them somewhere. (laughs) Um, I would say, I actually, when I first met my partner, he didn't know anything about Blavity. He didn't know who I was. You know, we met through a mutual friend at a bar, you know, so we actually didn't talk about work for like the first three to six months. I didn't really know what he did either. Um, And that was really freeing. Um, You know, he didn't care. (laughs) Like in his mind, he's like, she's cute. She's fun. She's smart. Like we're kicking it, you know, and um, I think that that approach where helped me because I didn't feel like our relationship was ever dependent on my identity as the CEO of Blavity or on me being achieving anything. You know, he'd be just as happy if I was a stay at home wife. Like he wouldn't be like, okay, do what you want to do. So I needed that. Cause I think in LA, a lot of times people see you for what you can bring to them, what kind of power couple you can be, what kind of lifestyle you guys can live if you combine your incomes and all types of stuff. And it puts a lot of pressure on maintaining whatever identity you had when you first joined that relationship. And I knew that at some point I might say, you know, I just want to be a full-time painter, (laughs) you know, or like, (laughs) let's go to Costa Rica for six months out of the year. Like, I just wanted to feel like in the relationship I could be Morgan Devon, you know, the person. And um, that's what I was dating for was, was finding somebody who would help me feel that way or give me the space to feel that way. And it would never, I would never have to shrink myself into whatever bucket or bowl they wanted to put me in. Not easy. And I had to do a lot of work to do that. I mean, I read relationship books. I had a relationship coach at one point. Um, I took a lot of femininity classes, like classes and um, books on like how to date as an alpha woman um, because I knew that I was going to be fighting an uphill battle to find someone that was my match. And especially with everything that you had done in business does Mm -hmm. require kind of a lot of masculinity of Mm -hmm. working in tech, being the founder of a startup, fundraising. I mean, I can't think of a process that sounds like more masculine than Oh, I was a a beast. (laughs) Yeah, I was was definitely in my masculine era. (laughs) Yeah, so it makes sense that you would have to learn how to shift your energy a bit. Yeah, how to be softer. I mean, I'll give you an example of my ritual. So after work, I used to, like at five o'clock, so I had a rule. I was like, five o'clock, you're done. This was regardless of any man. This was just like my thing go light all the candles in the house take a bath and then now you can like re-enter the space of your home and do whatever it is that you were going to do and that helped me just having a ritual of like okay you can turn off the masculine you can turn off the decision making you can turn off the this is what we're going to do right now what what's going on what are you doing turn that off and turn on the like (laughs) wow (sighs) <sighs> I can just flow like I'm just flowing in my house, you know, and I usually just walk around and just mm-hmm, turn on some music, you know, and that also gave me the mental space, I think, to live in my femininity and to feel really comfortable there. That's a beautiful ritual. It's like you're literally washing off that that energy and that persona to mm-hmm. move into the next part of your day. Yeah, no, I don't do that anymore. But <laughs> when I was trying to make that switch, I was intense about making that switch. And that would be my advice to any woman who's like, knows that they carry more masculine traits and like because of their job or their career, that's what they need to do to hit their goals. And I'm like, do it. Then learn how to rebalance yourself and learn how to, to shift your energy and just have that as a tool in your toolkit, you know? And when you need a reset, go ahead and do it. Um, So yeah, that was my ritual. I remember one time my partner came over and he he had seen me do this ritual. So he came over and I think I was like in the bathroom and I came out and all the candles were lit. And I was like, why did you light all the candles? (laughs) I wanted to light the candles. And he was like, because you do this every time. So I was trying to help you out. I was like, no, you don't get it. It's like a thing. So then I had to explain it to him and he thought I was the weirdest person ever, but (laughs) just, you know, everybody has their quirks. (laughs) And I mean, in that too, I mean, that also maybe could be an example of when I think about stepping into our femininity is Mm -hmm. also like being able to accept the help and like just to practice and allowing that. Because sometimes too, it's hard if you're not used to it, having that. Yeah. You are used to like lighting the candles or kind of doing everything yourself, allowing help. Yeah. Do less. Oh, I absolutely 
had all types of mantras of like, do less. Just do less, sis. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't open that door. Do less. You know, he wants to come and do the dishes, let him. Like, do, just let him. Do less. Because for the right person, for me, was going to do all the things. And in fact, it's so funny because actually I was had so many limitations in my mind about what could be that the list, I couldn't have written the list of what I wanted. Like, because I, I actually didn't have the capacity. Like, I didn't have, I was so masculine, I couldn't even write the list. So God handled it and the list was made for me. Mm. But I think learning how to... Um, I mean, part of it is making that investment, you know, part, like making the time investment um, and the mental space investment to figure out what you want. And I think a lot of high achieving women, they're so busy. We're so busy doing all the things that we don't necessarily make the time to actually slow down for an extended period of time, not just a month and be like, I'm just going to hit the apps and then I'm out. It's like, no, 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 no. This is like a two, three year, four year process. So if you want, if you say that you want the partnership and you say that you want to build a life with someone else, you got to make room. You got to make room. Definitely. As someone who is like currently on that journey now, yeah. one thing that I'm learning is to just do more things that I enjoy. Yeah. I'm a little bit of a busy body. Like i I like being home and I like downtime, but I can only do that so much before mm. I just get antsy. Mm -hmm. So it's like I like doing things, but not everything I do has to be work or has to be productive. Yeah. Doing things can be going to a museum or going to a yeah. cafe that I like or reading a book. Yeah, interesting at a bar. person. Yeah, just doing <laughs> like, things that you purely enjoy. Yeah. I'm like, well, when I meet somebody, I want to meet them doing things that I like. I don't want right. to be aggressively like treating it like a numbers game and yeah. doing all this because first of all people aren't numbers no. so I don't necessarily agree with the numbers game thing but like I want to do things that I enjoy and I want to do things that I enjoy with a person mm -hmm. and if all I do is work I wouldn't even know what to say you're gonna to date a workaholic yeah <laughs> like you'll just sit there and co-work together right. yeah that's no fun which is fine sometimes but that can't be the whole connection. yeah I agree I think what you're really saying is live a live a, a, a more full life you know and and figuring out before you can work on finding somebody else you got to figure out what the full life looks like for you and be completely I told myself I'm going to have to pick a world in which I'm completely happy being alone. And that was one of the reasons for my move because my parents lived there. So I was like, okay, if I'm going to be alone, I want to be near my family. If I'm going to be alone, I want to, you know, have pick up my painting again and, and work on my painting hobby. If I'm going to be alone, I want to travel and I want to experience the world. So you just do it. You just be the person that you want to be now, <laughs> right? Absolutely. And then typically everything else kind of works itself out. It does. Or it doesn't, but you're so happy. Right. And that's okay. And you're doing things that bring you joy. Right. Even just having hobbies. Mm -hmm. Like there was a point in time where if someone would ask me like, what do you do for fun? And I'd be like, fun. <laughs> I work on my podcast. What, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, especially when I was working full time and doing content on the side, I was like, fun. Yeah. What is that? Right. No, I completely agree. I'm like, oh, walk to work, right. listen to music. Like, Yeah. I mean, it's crazy how intense we all can be when you're locked in in your career. Also, it can get away from you. Your life can get away from you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So kind of moving on to your next milestone. Yeah. After that is that you are a new mom. I you am. had your first baby. Yeah. Baby boy a few months ago. I did. How, how are you feeling? How has motherhood been so far? Feel great today. Motherhood is a little ghetto sometimes, not going <laughs> to lie. Um, no, but he's precious. Langston, he's three months old. Um, how am I feeling? I feel great. The first few months, I really prepared a lot for, for birth and being pregnant. Like I prepared for fertility. I prepared for, you know, eating right, exercising, doing all the things, to keep my heart rate down, my blood pressure down to bring life into this world. I did not prepare for postpartum. I did not prepare for the hormonal shifts. I knew nothing about breastfeeding, really. Like, just kind of like, yeah, you just pop out the boob. Oh, no, no, no. It is much more complicated than that. I was pumping on the way here because I was just, just, the timing was off, you know? So it's, um, it's a lot more effort than I thought 
the mechanics of everything and the logistics of everything. Um, and it could just be because I'm a working mom. You know, I'm not a stay at home mom, but I also actually know I think that stay at home moms are probably working harder than the rest of us. So, yeah, I, I didn't anticipate that, but I'm adjusting, you know, and I have made the space to make that adjustment. And um, it's been a beautiful experience, like seeing him go from kind of this cute little blob that just kind of stares at you to now he giggles and he laughs and he, he's seeing things for the first time like he's seeing shadows for the first time he's seeing his hands for the first time he's recognizing that's mom that's dad you know that is just such a privilege to be able to experience that set of innocence and experience ex discovering life and wor the world for the first time i get to discover the world as a conscious adult, you know, because when we were, we were all babies, we don't remember that stuff, but now I get to watch him doing it. So I think that it just keeps everything in perspective. It's really hard to have a bad day when you have a smiley baby. <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's true. Yeah. You mentioned just kind of working through the mechanics of the postpartum yeah. period. What have been some things that have helped you? And I mean, you're still in the thick of it. I'm like, in it. Three months. Yeah. That's not a lot of time. Mm -mm. What have been some things that have been helpful for you? Well, um, I, I don't have body dysmorphia, but I did struggle with gaining so much weight because I'm 4'11 and I gained 45 pounds and I worked hard to be fit like you know i went to the gym three four times a week i eat really well like so to gain a lot of weight really quickly was like messing with my head and then there's this thing that happens on the internet where we see all these women snap back or so you think and so i was like when the baby got here i was like wait a minute what's this 25 pounds lingering on around here what's this and so one of the things that i had to think about was like okay this isn't a short-term thing like I thought it was going to be done once the baby was here and it just kind of just kind of flows away I don't know I didn't think about it that hard to be honest so I had to start thinking about it I said okay well what's the nutrition that I need to have what's going on with my hormones um you know I I emailed a friend who's a hormonal expert I said well, what do I need to be doing to balance this out you know um, you can't really diet, you can't really work out that hard because I'm breastfeeding, so it's not like I didn't wanna do anything to jeopardize um, my milk supply. So you gotta do weight training. So I said, like, oh, well now I gotta figure out how do I do all these weights? Like, you know, you're in the gym, you're kinda doing stuff, it's like, oh no, you gotta do it the right way. Um, so I bought a, a weight training program and I just took it step by step, but it took me a few weeks, which felt like years. One thing about postpartum is everything feels more loud. You're dealing with so many hormones. Everything is more intense. Everything is more urgent. Everything is more jarring. And so it felt like this must be handled. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, I'm lucky to be in a community of incredible women. So I just asked them, I said, what am I supposed to do? And they gave me all of the advice and the feedback. And um, but I, I, and then I you know, took some, threw some out and feel so much better now but part of it is just everything is new everything is new it's a new human being i'm a mom for the first time you're now parents with someone else for the first time making decisions i've got grandparents now who have opinions where i'm like i didn't care about your opinion before but now i kind of now i kind of <laughs> have to listen to what you're saying um and so just giving myself the space especially as an entrepreneur where I had the company, you know, I took maternity leave and I was pretty serious about being on maternity leave. Like I didn't join meetings and things like that. Um, to me, being able to make the space to deal with whatever changes were coming our way was really helpful. Definitely. It's a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. Do not get pregnant unless you think through postpartum, I would say. You gotta think through not just the pregnancy, but the after the pregnancy. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it, it just having observed other people do yeah. it, you know, friends. I have a new nephew who is Aww. like the same age as, as Langston. Oh, um, fun. And seeing other people do it, it's like there is so much build up to the event of birth, which is major, especially for black women. So many things we have to consider, precautions so we need to take. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, after that, it's like, oh, that was the beginning. <laughs> the beginning of 10 years of change, you know, 15, 18 years, I guess. 
of my future. I mean, I called my mom yesterday, so forever, forever a change. Absolutely. Oh, same. I still, I bug my parents every day. <laughs> yeah, it never ends. It never ends. <laughs> never ends. Yeah, exactly. So it is, like, I didn't think about that. Like, my son will be calling me when he's my age. How cool. But yeah, no, you don't think about that when you're, like, trying to be pregnant. So that's what I'm saying when I'm saying like just the mechanics of like the entirety of the life change felt overwhelming to me at the time. And now I'm like, okay, this is great. Like, this is good. I'm good. But I needed to have the space to actually go through all of those emotions. A big adjustment Mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. How has motherhood shifted your definition of success? Ooh, um, I think that my redefined definition of success when I was prioritizing myself over my career um, was that fundamental shift. And now it's just a further pressure test on it. So when rubber makes hits the road and I have an event I can go to or I can stay home and do his nighttime routine and keep him on his schedule, what am I gonna pick? You know, um, it was really hard for me to leave him like even for like a half a day or leave him for, you know, for someone to have to feed him a bottle of breast milk, like I would cry. I'd be like, wait, I'm on the way, I'm coming. Like just, I'm almost there, like hold off. And they're like, he's screaming. We, It's your breast milk, like we could feed him. It was really hard for me. Um, so yeah, I'm learning to give myself space and to create some sort of sustainable for him and for me where I can be able to step away and come back. But the trade-off, my decision-making trade-off is much higher. Like leaving the house for a day is an actual trade-off or um, when I start traveling and leaving him home, that's going to be a trade-off, you know? And so the threshold for why I'm leaving much, much higher now, much higher. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Just clarity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just clarity. I got something to leave. I didn't have anything to leave before. Who cared? Right. Now yeah. I care. Yeah. So that decision-making <laughs> process just looks different when it's mm-hmm. just you versus me and somebody else yeah Yeah. and I'm sure people feel this way about other things but I hadn't felt that way like I was just kind of a free spirit even my partner I'm like let's go come with me you know but you can't do that with the baby you don't want the baby on a plane all the time or running around LA doesn't work for him (laughs) (laughs) yeah maybe not best for the baby schedule probably not best for the baby (laughs) schedule so I'm like oh man all right I'll see you later And you also mentioned how you took maternity leave. Mm -hmm. What did that process look like as an entrepreneur? Did you have to do a lot of prep leading up to it? And what has that been like? Yeah, it's been, um, it was a lot of prep, definitely. I actually really first started, when I first decided that I wanted to have a baby and that we wanted to go on this parenthood journey, that's actually when I started to prep for it. So one of the things that I did was hire our CFO and uh, he's a chief business officer as well. And that was helpful. I needed somebody who was going to hold me down on just like the boring stuff, you know, legal, people ops, finance, like, but also core, core to the business, core to operating. Um, and so that was that was something that I did was hire some people to do some of the things that as the CEO, I don't really have to be doing, but I was doing or I was involved in where it's like, you know, maybe not a good use of my time anymore. So it was kind of a placebo effect to further along the maturity of our operations at the company. And then I worked with those folks for about three to six months um, just to make sure everything was stable. And then I did a next iteration of that. Okay, what else am I doing that I maybe don't need to be doing? Um, Just so that when I was on maternity leave, it didn't, I have this weird responsibility where I feel, I feel responsible to, I feel the responsibility of everybody else. So I wanted to make sure if I'm out, it didn't impact the company to the extent that I could control it. Um, and so that was the next thing that I did. And then I'm also a busybody. So I had the podcast, you know, I'm writing my first book, which comes out later this year. And I, so I was like, okay, well, I need to start batching things. So that's, that was my next step was just to, again, create some space so that I could go through whatever feelings I was going through. I could take time off without worrying about being on camera. Um, and so I started to batch a bunch of content just to make sure that there was a, a casual flow of some sort of consistency while I was out. And that's really it. Um, 
And I think, I, I guess maybe the last thing I did was just tell people that I really was taking time off. I don't think people really believed me. And by people, I mean my employees. I think they were like, no, she's going to be online. I'm like, no, I'm really not. <laughs> I'm really not going to be online. Um, I'm going to read things. I'm going to see, like, kind of check in, but I'm not going to go back and forth. I'm not going to provide my input. Um, and I had to just reiterate that a bunch because if I didn't, then people would have called me. I'm like, well, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't have an opinion. Don't call me. <laughs> call Wasif, my CFO. Yeah. 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 Right. And actually sticking to that boundary, which they had never seen that version of me before. That She's back. Good for everybody involved. <laughs> it was great. I think it was great for everyone involved. Now, the interesting challenge is not reverting back to who I was before. Like, I was talking to my team and I was like, you know, I don't think you guys need my opinion. Like, you got it, you know? And you did fine without me. So what are we doing? Like, let me, I'm going to go work on some other things for the business. And my team was like, yeah, girl, like you were working, you know, most like white male CEOs don't work like you work. You know, they don't do all the things that you're doing. They're, they're working like you were working on maternity leave. And I'm like, you know what? You're probably <laughs> right. <laughs> I was probably overworking. Um, and so I'm channeling my inner white man right now and um, <laughs> just going to stick with the boundaries. And um, there's things that I'm responsible for, but not go back to where I was. Definitely. You don't need to be as accessible for things that may not be the priority. They messed up now because they proved to me that they could do it on the <laughs> their own. So I'm going to let you do it. Y'all got it. Yeah, y'all got it. I'll see you on the monthly meeting. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's I great. That. I think that's good. And it also like allows other people to step up as leaders and, yeah. and grow and develop too. I saw that so much. Like people who had been saying, I can do more. I want to take on more. And... Um, that had the opportunity to and now I'm like great here's a raise title change have at it it's all yours you got it you got it yeah it's great I would also like to talk to you a little bit about podcasting sure so you're like almost a year into your podcast yeah experience with your show the journey mm -hmm. which I love the concept of where you sit down you get people's stories of you know founders mm -hmm. actors creators what inspired you to start the show and why is it important to let people kind of talk about their journeys in their own words? Yeah, I, um, this is my second podcast. I had a business podcast called Work Smart Before where I was just doing my normal hardcore Morgan stuff where I'm like, this is what you do. Read this, watch this, you know, here's how you think about fundraising. And what I was realizing as I was um, interacting with more and more people in my community was that, um, there was a disconnect between people seeing successful folks and not understanding how those people got there. Um, or I wouldn't say not understanding, a misunderstanding of how people got there and um, a simplification of how people got there. And that I think does a disservice to us all. And I wanted to create a space where we could all really in a long form format talk about how we were doing what we we're doing and frankly the dirtiness of it all right like when you, you've been on my podcast that episode's coming out soon and um you've been in the mud like you were working your butt off like what that's crazy <laughs> you know and if somebody looks at you now they may be like oh my god like let's do a meal like it's popping like it's like whoa 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 back it up back it up back it up this is actually how you got here. These are the trade-offs that you made. These are the choices that you made. It wasn't glitz and glamour. It wasn't, you know, red carpet. It wasn't that in the beginning. It never is. But Instagram and TikTok and everything makes it seem like that. Or it's it's the life we, we wish that it was that easy. Sometimes I think people see that stuff, absorb it because they wish it was that easy. And it's actually, no, it's actually really hard. Um, and... That's why I started it, was just to help create more space for people sharing the how, um, and then also hopefully giving people some self-confidence as they are approaching their own journey to say, stick it out, you can do it, you can do the hard thing, you can do the work, stick it out, let's go. Which I think is so important, because I think we all have a tendency to kind of glamorize other people's lives, and I don't think social media helps that, because we only... We, we can't see 24 hours of someone's day. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it makes us kind of romanticize other people's lives. If we'll see a small snippet of a person and we'll assume, oh, that was so easy for them. Or like, oh, they have all of this and that. Meanwhile, people have no idea what's going on behind the scenes or what comes to that. Even just yesterday, I posted an Instagram story because I was preparing for the podcast interviews and I Mm -hmm. listed out, here's everything that we do to prepare for a podcast episode. And a one hour episode easily has 15 to 20 hours of work behind it to bring it out. And people are like, oh, I thought you just sat down and talked oh come on guys no there's so (laughs) much more that you just may not realize (laughs) right and hearing people share that is so important absolutely and not just you there's a producer there's somebody helping like edit this there's like it's an entire army you know and i'm glad that we make things look effortless however it is not good for people to just absorb that effortless they need to really understand like okay This is what it takes. And the reason why I'm saying this is because sometimes I think people make leaps prematurely. They're making the leap to say, well, I can do a podcast. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can. You can do whatever you want to do. However, make sure you know all the work and the consistency and the dedication that it takes. You got to have weekly episodes. You know, I had weekly episodes out. Even the week I gave birth, an episode came out. Now I pre-recorded it. But you've got to prep for every single thing because... That's what it takes, right? Um, Yeah. And then they wonder why they fail. I'm like, well, you didn't do all the things. Definitely. Exactly. Looking at something from all angles. Mm -hmm. And I think the other beauty of people sharing their journeys and their stories is that nobody has it all figured out, especially when someone is just starting. And I think oftentimes when people either want to start a business or change a career or start a podcast, they think that they have to know everything about it. And the common denominator in every story is like people figure it out as they go and they Mm -hmm. learn as they go. Mm -hmm. I still don't know everything about podcasts. I'm still, there's so many things I'm still trying to figure out. Right. And hearing that from people of, oh, it's okay. Okay, this person doesn't know everything either. I don't need to know everything to start. I need to have a scrappiness and a willingness to start. Yeah, and regardless of where you are in your journey, you might be the best of the best in the podcast game and then you're on a, you're a, a novice at the relationship part of your life or you're a novice on the health part or the wellness part of your life you're a novice at the hobby that you're starting if you're starting golf or you're learning spanish on duolingo or whatever like it's okay to be a novice it's okay to be a beginner at something it's okay to like not know it all all the time and i might my hope is by people listening to the podcast i talk about all the things i don't know a lot i use myself as a guinea pig often in the podcast and I often use it as an excuse to bring experts on to help me you know I'm like give me the advice right now tell me you know and my hope is that vulnerability allows for other people to allow themselves to be vulnerable and to talk to experts hire experts read new books and be a novice in something absolutely I one uh kind of profound uh tidbit that I gained in being okay being a student from mm-hmm. Beyonce, of course. We love Beyonce. Shout out to Bay. Shout out Come to Come on, Beyonce. country. Let's Talk go. About, yeah, I'm so excited. Let's go. I can't wait for that tour. I'm like, are we going to go on tour again? Like, what's happening? I sure like, hope so. I want to know the Let rollout plan. Let me start saving my money right now. Yes. <laughs> um, was that part in Homecoming where she talks mm-hmm. about the importance of being a student and how people often are blocked from their greatness because they don't want to rehearse, because they don't want to look dumb, because they don't want to ask mm-hmm. questions and be that student. And that nugget like replays in my head over and over Mm -hmm. it's okay to be a student Mm -hmm. if you want to grow at something you have to be willing to rehearse and practice and look dumb and stumble absolutely and get back up yeah i just hired um a new executive coach for myself because i felt like at this new level that our business is getting into and then also the fact that i'm now a mom i'm like i don't know how to do this i don't know how to operate at at this level of achievement and operate as a good partner and a good mom i need help you know and just being able to say i don't know but i know where i want to be that is just the beginning you know and like you it's okay like there's no shame there's no like someone tapping me on the shoulder like there's no sometimes it's like who are we living for who are we worried about yeah are we shaming ourselves for not knowing things where it's like how how would you know that if you've never managed a business at that level before, if you've right. never been a parent before? Right. 
of course it makes sense to get help to learn how to operate at that level because it's like we've never done it. And sometimes yeah. I think we shame ourselves for mm-hmm. things that we haven't done. Yeah, shame is the right word. Yeah. yeah. It's that is really what it is. Who's the shame expert? Is it it's not Glenn Doyle? Is it Brene oh, Brown? Brene, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So there you have it. Mm-hmm. Go watch Brene's podcast <laughs> yeah. if you struggle with the shame. But right. no, but like actually there is someone for everything in this world. Absolutely. Morgan, I loved this conversation. So fun. Thank you so much for joining me, for sharing more about your journey. So many nuggets here to help people step into their successful eras. Can you please let our audience know where they can find you, where they can find your podcast, how yeah. they can keep in touch? You can listen to our podcast anywhere that podcasts are. Um, hit me up on Instagram. I have a bunch of fun channels where I just say all of my random thoughts all day. I'm having so much fun in my broadcast channels. And also subscribe to YouTube. Watch the videos on YouTube because I talk with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thanks so much for having me. Oh my gosh, thank you for joining me. We'll have that all linked in the show notes. Make it easy Love it. for everybody to find Easy you. peasy. Yes. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Balanced Black Girl. If you liked this episode, please make sure you leave us a rating and a review. I would appreciate your five stars. We're always trying to offer a five-star experience. And if you're not yet subscribed, either on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, make sure you're subscribed so that you get new episodes every Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in and I will see you.